feels, it feels slightly like old times having a sound check uh, at, the, at the beginning of the process. Um, can everybody hear me all right? Is that yes. reasonably comfortable? Because uh, it's so much easier if we don't have to, to use microphones. Um, but let's pass over to Guy before I formally introduce him and just see whether you're going to be able to hear him as well. And, uh, and Guy, um, just how does it feel sitting in the midst of this collection of your work, just for, just for volume? Well, I've seen it all before. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect beginning, and I, I'm assuming from that uh, great projection that, that people could hear all right. Look, it's uh, such a delight to be able to be here this morning, uh, this morning, and um, and I have to say, uh, it, it's such an honour uh, to be here this morning uh, with Guy. Um, Guy is, without any doubt, one of the most extraordinary figures in Australian art. Uh, and it is wonderful to see that the entire Shoalhaven Regional Gallery has been given over to such a range of his lifetime's work. Many of you, of course, uh, know Guy very well. I know many of you um, are friends of his, and it's great to see that, uh, that support. But many of you may not know him quite so well, so we hope this will be a, a great introduction. Um, I won't try to list all of his achievements, but you know, Guy is an Archibald Prize winner. Um, he's won, well, more awards than you can poke a stick at across the country over many, many years. Uh, he was even asked to design some of the portraits on Australia's banknotes when we moved to decimal currency. Uh, you know, he is an extraordinary figure. He's been one of the great teachers of Australian art uh, and a constant and enthusiastic practitioner. And many of you will know, but some of you may not, that he has been exerting his creative energy for many many years. I hope you don't mind me saying Guy, but Guy is 97. Oh. Um, and I have to say very simply that if I have half the energy and ability at 97, yes. I will be deeply grateful. I wish we every night. That's <laughs> But let's get a little bit of a chat underway. I hope many of you have had a chance to have a look around this wonderful exhibition. But all of you will have walked past the wonderful, I guess, installation at the front of the gallery, the, the symbolic river with the canoe. And of course, there's the river here on the wall as well. Um, and many of these works, most of these works, one way or another, have to do about a, a relationship with the environment. Guy, the environment, is that absolutely the core of your uh, creative motivation? Yeah, I guess it is. And it's, um, I don't, because my kids are grown up now, I don't know what young people do, but <clears throat> when I was any age from 14 onwards, I spent with my brother canoeing, camping, Walking and learning about the bush, I guess, not just experiencing it, but learning about it. And um, I feel I'm part of a landscape, I guess, and that's that sounds a bit corny, but I've always liked the <coughs> attitude of, of the South Pacific peoples and the Australian Aboriginal peoples. And, who believe that they and the landscape are not separate, that we're all part of one thing, whatever that thing is. And I like that general idea. Um, well, in fact, uh, a, a book uh, about you focused very much on the concept of Gaia. Yeah. Um, and I guess many people here would know that, that Gaia is that concept that the whole of the planet is just one living organism. One living is, organism. is that something that appeals to you? Yes, it is indeed. That's why I chose the title of the book, uh, Searching for Gaia, because that uh, was indeed what I thought it was about. I still feel like that. I think um, it sometimes worries me that I might have focused too much on that and limited other ways of reading. For other people, um, I don't know. 
but still, yes, to answer your question, that is essential. It's part of my attitude, and it's something that I am still involved with. And it's been a, a very big part of your life, as I say, that uh, uh, wonderful river and the canoe <coughs> out at the front of the gallery uh, is a reference to a very important trip that you made, and indeed this kind of Shoalhaven connection, because back in was it 1939? 39. I think, um, <laughs> you canoed with your uh, with your brother all the way from the gorge country near Goulburn, all the way here to Nara and the sea uh, over several days. What a journey that must have been! That was a great journey. Yep, yeah. it's one of those things that you remember all your life. And the um, children of my brother, <clears throat> I think, are here today, and he kept talking about it. He sadly died many years ago, but he talked about it all his life as well. It was an essential part of growing up. It was a boy's own adventure sort of story. There are lots of other people who've done it, uh, men and women, um, but for a 17-year-old kid, it was an experience every second of which I still remember. And the country is just so marvellous really. That river is incredible. There's a dam across it now, so one, one can't do it any longer, not for the whole journey. But it was exciting, it was fantastic, it was difficult, it was dangerous, it was a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of the art, as we can see on these walls here, and indeed there are numerous references to figures in boats, and I'm not suggesting mm -hmm. it all came from that one trip. But clearly, from those experiences of the environments that you have been part of, symbolism and visual imagery has flown from, has, has, some, has come from. Yes, of course, but you know, it doesn't refer only to that particular journey. The metaphor or the symbol of a boat is something which people, artists, poets have been using for centuries, one way or another. So it has deeper meanings than my particular journey down that particular river. Um, you know, one can think of symbolism from every country in the world, from every culture in the world, where they use the boat for some reason or other. So it's a, it's a universal symbol, and that interests me. Theoretically, it reaches more people. It does seem, though, as though, again, as people look around uh, your works, there are some figures and some symbols that have occurred and then reoccurred. Yeah, boring, no, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that worries me too. I keep <laughs> but but those, those figures often seem to have some connection to something that's happened in the environment. There's the, there's the winged man, a, a flying figure. Uh, there is the, um, uh, the tree fern woman. Uh, there is the boat, uh, as, we've, as we've referred to. These things kind of give a, a point of reference or a connection into the environment somehow. Yeah, well, I'd like to think so. The winged creature you probably know about, um, it all started off because I saw hang gliders leaning off the cliffs above my little shack at Jamboree, and I thought they were, that was an incredibly dangerous thing to do. The, I think the local council stopped them doing it. They could have landed in the rain <coughs> on top of a stinging tree or something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, and that was the point where I used it not just as a flying creature, but to perhaps refer to the idea of leaping off cliffs. And sometimes those cliffs are real cliffs, and sometimes <coughs> they're metaphoric cliffs. So I think the idea of taking risks, of leaping into space, is essential to the idea of living. I think life is about taking risks and art is about taking risks and I don't think one takes, well I haven't taken enough of them and uh, I would like to take more if there's any time. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean one of the most adventurous things in many ways that you did as, a, as an artistic statement referring to that flying figure um, is shown on the photograph which as you go out of the wall, out of the doors here is on the wall on the, the left hand side and that's the, the Icarus figure, which was painted in the sky by a plane, by a, a, a sky writer. 
um, over Sydney, you know, in, in <coughs> several kilometres of width. Yeah, I know, about three or four kilometres. That was fun to do. But the actual figure came from other things as well. And um, <coughs> many of you know the Scott of Bert Flugelman, um, who had a, sh uh, I'm going to say a shack, had a beautiful house next to my crummy little shack at Jamaroo. And there are some there's works of his all around Sydney and in Adelaide, and particularly in uh, Canberra. Well, Bert challenged me one night, I think we'd all had too much red wine, he challenged me to paint him for the Archibald. Um, and I said, right over Bert, you know. And I didn't think about it for a week, and he rang me up a week later and said, when are we going to start? So I was stuck with it, so I thought I'd better do something about it. So I started to paint Bert, <clears throat> and I was looking, I got a good likeness, and I was looking for something which had some reference to Bert's character. And Bert was a risk taker. He did astonishing things and fell, took risks all the time, fell flat on his face several times, but he'd always pick himself up and start again. <coughs> One of Bert's favourite sayings was, when in doubt, jump. <laughs> <laughs> so Bert jumped many times. Anyway, I painted this portrait of him, and then I thought, well, what can I put in it that gives some reference to his character? And I thought of the wings, so I started painting my little wingman behind him as some reference to his idea of taking risks. And halfway through the painting, and this is, this is really weird, halfway through the painting I suddenly realised that Bert's name, which is German, Flugelman, is German for wingman. It is a direct translation. Now that really, I thought, made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. So that's when I used it for Bert. And it should be said that that little challenge that Bert threw down to you to uh, paint him for the Archibald resulted in you winning the Archibald <laughs> with that picture. Yeah, first time in, I should have entered again. I mean, I had a 100% success rate. <laughs> <laughs> I should have stopped at that point. Um, and the other figure, the one that was done in the sky, was the result of uh, Nick Waterloo's idea. <coughs> Nick Waterloo was... Um, head of the gallery at Kofa, looked up for the gallery there, and having an exhibition devoted to the idea of drawing and questioning what drawing was about and what the parameters of drawing might be, and rang me up and asked me if I'd put something in, so I did, and I thought, well, hell, you know, what can I do that is different? So I got the yellow pages out and looked right through it for somebody who did sky drawing, and I found thousands <coughs> of people who did lots of funny things. I finally found one bloke, and one thing led to another, and you know, finally I found some bloke in Queensland, I think, who did sky drawing. So I sent him hundreds of photographs of my drawing, and he said he could do it, and he did a trial run up there, and it looked wonderful. So I asked him to do it on the day of the show here in Sydney, the day of the opening of the show, and unfortunately, that day dawned grey and cold. And I was on the phone every 10 minutes to the flyer who lived up the coast, God knows where, and he was saying, no, you can't do it today. So this went on for about four or five days, and finally one day, it was a Sunday, he said, you can have sun over Sydney today, do it today or not at all. So I said, OK, let's do it. Go for it, baby. So we did it that day, and I thought, oh, I had to get some publicity out of this. So I rang every newspaper and every television station I could find, and I said something like, I suppose, I'm a local artist, and I'm going to do a drawing at, at um, 3,000 feet, or whatever it was, over Sydney Harbour at midday today. And every time I spoke to a journalist, he put the phone down and said, right, I'm like, I'm like, what's wrong with these guys? And it wasn't until about three or four days later that I realised where I'd gone wrong. That particular date was the 1st of April. Oh. <laughs> Sometimes you can't pick them. <laughs> well, at least we've got evidence, photographic evidence yeah. outside, that it really happened and, uh, and what, a, what an extraordinary gesture that was. Another very influential time that, that happened for you, um, which was not that long after that great trip down the Shoalhaven River, uh, was that you 
the war came along, um, and you went off to Queensland to train in jungle warfare, but that also took you into the rainforest. What were your first impressions of seeing really tropical rainforest for the first time? I think I was enthralled, um, and I'm not sure why. I feel sympathy with that thickness of bush which somehow seems to overpower you, overtake you. You become part of it. Um, it just encompasses you. You're, you're a beetle in it. Um, you're totally insignificant in this mass of jungle. And apart from that, of course, the mountains are great. The streams are rushing and clear and sweet. Um, everybody else hated this course, but in a funny way, I I loved it. It was just great, great country. Um, and did you start to to make any drawings or little sketches? I had a sketch at that early stage. Yeah, I did. I had a sketchbook there during the course, um, which I think the. Uh, the War Museum has now. And then of course I went to New Guinea and other funny places up there and the rainforest gets denser and heavier up there. The rainforest we have here is subtropical rainforest, is it? I keep forgetting the title. Mm -hmm. Up there it's tropical rainforest and it is much, much denser. It's like a wall. You find yourself faced by this green mass of jungle. Look, I don't know the answer to why I like it. I just react to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting you mentioned earlier about uh, that respect that you have for indigenous peoples and their sense of belonging mm -hmm. with the land. Um, and when you were up in Bougainville, uh, you became very interested in the indigenous people there and, and their appearance and their relationship to the rainforest and started to incorporate that later in your in your paintings, what was it that appealed to you about them and their relationship? I think, first of all, the fact that um, they totally unselfconsciously decorated themselves, um, which of course is why people now, and people have always done this, but it hasn't been in our culture until now. It's changed now, and then, you know, a lot of people decorate themselves with, with uh, tattoos now, which certainly wouldn't have happened in, in my youth. You haven't got your first tat yet. <laughs> I haven't got my first tat yet. If I had, I'd show it to you, but I haven't, I haven't got it. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> well, I have to say that's probably a great thing to do at this at this stage. That would be a, a really a really terrific statement. But Where's that, yours? <laughs> maybe <laughs> impending, perhaps. Maybe we can make a deal. <laughs> we'll make a deal. All right. <laughs> Um, but just going back to back to those those decorated people, did that decoration, in a sense, connect them to the landscape? Did you see a, a connection there? <clears throat> well, I thought so. I mean, the landscape up there is is bigger and better than ours. I mean, everything is bigger. The bugs are bigger. <laughs> the flowers are bigger. The texture, the the jungle is bigger. Everything is on a bigger scale, a denser scale, a thicker scale. And I was fascinated by the way these blokes quite unselfconsciously decorated themselves. If you gave them anything at all, they'd shove it in their hair or put it on their body. Um, and I don't like keeping on telling this story, but one particular thing, I suppose, started me off. I was drawing a big black bloke in Bougainville, the island of Bougainville, and the Bougainville people are very, very black. They're the blackest in the South Pacific. And I had nothing... <laughs> Those were the colonial days when you gave them a cigarette or tobacco uh, as payment. And I had I'd run out of cigarettes and tobacco and everything else. And the only thing I could find in my tent was a tin of talcum powder, which I never used, but the Comfort Fund sent us talcum powder to help with skin disease. I don't think anybody used it. They probably thought it was sissy, I've no idea. Anyway, I gave this big black bloke a tin of talcum powder <clears throat> as payment. The first thing he did was to empty it into his hand and make these wonderful, great big white marks all over his big black body. And I thought, Christ, that is marvellous. <laughs> was such a visual statement. And you didn't have a camera handy? No, I didn't. Ah. <laughs> so, 
I guess that was one of the things, and other things have followed since then. And I, I'm embarrassed at this story because I've told it too often and I'm sick of hearing it. <laughs> we, we haven't, though. Yeah. 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 Well, some of you have, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> <coughs> After the war, I got married, my wife and I went to London. And I, <coughs> I was, I'd had three years at the art school and I'd studied art before the war, so I had a lot of skills at my fingertips. But it's not about skill, I mean, it's about saying something worthwhile. Um, and I tried to paint London. <clears throat> I've never been to London before and it didn't mean anything to me. Fascinating being there, but I, I didn't know well enough to paint. I couldn't paint the English landscape, it's just like a great big beautiful park. It wasn't my land. And in desperation I started to paint my memories of New Guinea. It's an odd thing to do, and the way I'd stumbled across local and indigenous people bathing in the streams. Anyway, that was the general core of what I was painting. And then <coughs> I saw on a little black and white television set we had a documentary of some bloke had been to Mount Hagen in the highlands of New Guinea, and made a film, I think probably the first film he'd made, of the dancers at Mount Hagen from all the South Pacific Islands and the wonderful decorations with masks and body decorations and feathers, you name it, that incredibly inventive. So I wrote to the BBC and said, I'm a young Australian painter in London painting New Guinea. And somebody, <coughs> the BBC thought, here's a dumb character, you know. <laughs> what, what, you know, what is this guy? So they passed it on to somebody else who probably passed it on to somebody else. And I got a phone call one day from some bloke who said he thought that he might be able to help me and he introduced himself over the phone. He said his name was David Attenborough and would I like to come around for a drink? <laughs> so we went around for a drink and I asked him to sell me some photographs, but he wouldn't do that. He lent them to me. Um, and from those, I did a lot of drawings and from those, I did a lot of fantasies, I suppose, um, and did a whole body of work, which is, which I suspect I'm still doing today. So it was a, a definitive point, um, an important definitive point, I is, think, in my life. Is Attenborough aware that uh, he played a, a pivotal role in your art career? Yeah, the reason I don't like telling this story is because once I tell it, Everybody says, ah, oh, you're a friend of David Attenborough. <laughs> you know, this was 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. Um, he probably never thought of me since. I have been in touch with him about four or five or six times. And yes, I think he might be, I'm not sure. I saw a documentary, an interview which, um, what's the name of that ABC bloke who did a series of interviews called Enough Rope? Andrew Denton. Andrew Denton. I saw an interview by Andrew Denton, an interview with David Attenborough, and I thought it was a great interview, so I, and that's one of the few occasions when I've written to David and said, I've seen this interview, I think it was great. Um, and David wrote back to say it was the best interview he'd ever had, <coughs> uh, given that this guy has had thousands of interviews. But to say that that one was the best he'd ever had was a great feather in Denton's cap. Mm -hmm. So. A week after that, I was having lunch at a little place in Padua with John, with um, Anne Thompson, <coughs> an artist. And Denton was at a couple of tables away eating on his own. I thought, should I tell this guy? But you can't interrupt, you know. I didn't like to do that. But anyway, eventually he got up to pay his bill, and I thought, damn it, I will tell him. So I stopped him and told him that I just had a letter from David Attenborough to say, that his interview was the best interview he'd ever had. Denton stopped in the middle of a cafe and threw his arms in the air and said, that is the best thing you could ever have told me. <laughs> so I had a lot to Denton said that. that so I'm glad I told him. I'm, I think we're glad you did too. <laughs> Looking around the gallery, just coming back to this uh, wonderful exhibition, uh, people can't help but be struck by the 
enormous variety of approach over the period of, uh, of your long painting career, uh, from works uh, in the far room, some of which are really very literal landscapes, lovely views of the, the mist coming down over the escarpment and so on, uh, through to the, the much more abstract, some almost totally abstract works. How have you managed over yeah, the years to, to <coughs> find that balance between your, your love for abstraction and your capacity for literal painting? I think sometimes I see that as a weight on my shoulder, as a load on my shoulder. Um, there, look, some of these works are 50 or 60 years old, so one doesn't paint the same thing the whole time. But a long time ago, a long time ago, I did make the firm decision <laughs> not to paint the same damn painting year after year after year. Now, I know a lot of people do that, and they do it for all sorts of good reasons. Mm -hmm. They love it when somebody goes into somebody else's house and say, oh, you've got a you've got a so-and-so on the wall. You've got a Fred Note painting there. <laughs> and I decided I wasn't going to do that. Look, it's great for the bank balance if you can do that. I think it's awfully bad for the soul. So I decided a long time ago that I, I wasn't going to paint the same damn painting year after year after year. And I won't name the names of those people who have, and they're all good, some of them are good friends of mine, and they... Well, they're all called Fred Nurk, aren't they? They're all <laughs> Fred Nurk, yeah. um, you, you, you made mention of that, uh, of, you know, of that sense of good for the soul, what was, what was good for your soul. As you look around an exhibition <laughs> like this now and see a pretty good representation of your, of your life's work or over many, many years, can you share with us how you feel? Does it, does it feel like a, a, a great variety of work over many years? I can only see the bloody mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> I can only look at them and think, I could have done that better. I don't think any artist has ever said anything else. You could always do it better or do it differently. And that's what always worries me. You could do it better. Um, isn't isn't that like, part of what an artist needs, though? That push to always want to do that's it That's what I think applies to all of us, not just to artists. I would like to think it applies to anybody. You could always do it better. I could have been a better husband, I could have been a better father, I'm bloody sure of that. Um, I think you'd always do it better, and you always hope for a second chance. You never get it most of the time. <laughs> Sometimes you get a pretty long run. <laughs> Sometimes you get a long run if you're like, yeah. Speaking of that long run, let me just briefly take you right back to the very beginning, back to your childhood, because your, your parents um, were musical people rather than visual arts people. Did you ever consider the possibility of being musical yes, rather than visual? Yeah, that's one of my great regrets. I thought I'd be, I wanted to be either an artist, a journo, or a musician. And both my parents were musos, but they had a rough during the Great Depression. Um, Dad was thrown out of work, and they struggled, they really struggled after that. And mum had two kids to survive, to help survive. So I don't think they were all that keen on me being in the museum. I did do some piano lessons and never practiced enough. And I think I was more interested in drawing. So that's taken over, but it is a regret. I'd like to have been a musician. Musicians have a lot more fun than painters. <laughs> they do. Painting is a lonely occupation. I mean, you know. All those painters who are near here know that. You're in your studio, you're on your own, you're battling with a stupid bloody bit of canvas <laughs> and you wonder why you're doing it. I look at musos, jazz musos particularly, they're laughing, they have a great idea, they play something, they toss the idea to somebody else who picks it up and does something with it. I think what a great life that is. I'm Maybe sure. there's some form of art jazz that we can kind of experiment with. Well, you can certainly work on the one painting, but I'm, that's, uh, yeah, people do that. They have done it. I haven't done it. You have, though, made a, a great contribution to the teaching process um, over uh, many years. Um, I mean, you were head of painting at the Sydney College of Arts for 
a decade or so. Um, Lloyd Rees actually personally invited you to come and teach at the, uh, the School of Architecture with him. How important has it been for you to be able to help other either young or less experienced artists to explore their capabilities? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I think some of those students might think I was a dead loss and a waste of time and a waste of space. <laughs> Others have been very kind and said that that was a help to them. For those people, I am intensely grateful. I think teaching is a great occupation and I've enjoyed it. The only problem that I could see is that after a while, if you're not careful, you find yourself saying the same things because students find the same problems. Um, the most important thing is a teacher can do is to give people confidence, for God's sake. And it seems to me that if you can do that, you've made a contribution. Bringing us back to uh, the landscape and, and back to this landscape, um, you mentioned a little earlier when you were in England, and you spent quite a lot of time overseas yeah, over the sure. years. <laughs> um, but you, you did say that this, this was not your country. It didn't feel like, like your place. Now that you're here in Australia, does Australia and the Australian landscape feel like your place? And in particular, um, you do have some land up on the uh, escarpment uh, at Jamboree, and does that feel like your place? Do you have a, a sense of that connection, finally, with the land? The simple answer is yes. Somebody asked me <coughs> some few years ago whether I felt Australian or not, and the, the jokey answer to that is that there are two qualifications <coughs> that you must have in order to feel Australian. One is that you must like, um, um, what's that brown stuff that we put on that toast? It's bitchy. Oh, bitchy. <laughs> <laughs> you must like bitchy. I hate bitchy. <laughs> and the other qualification is that you must like the rain on, on a tin roof. Oh, yeah. That makes me feel lonely and sad. I can't, I'm maybe too many years under canvas, but I don't, like the sound of rain. Do I feel part of that land? Yes, I do. I, I understand, I think, how indigenous people talk about land as being part of them. I do feel part of that land, yeah. Well, I think as we look around this exhibition, we can see that sense of connection, and I think we're all uh, feeling very honoured that we can be part of that sense of identity that you feel with the Australian landscape, but very particularly with this landscape here in the Shoalhaven. So it's been wonderful that you have shared so generously your thoughts and insights today. We could talk for a lot longer, but uh, we must wrap up now. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a huge thank you to Gary. <laughs>